Hi, good evening and welcome to our latest in our series of creative conversations. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Tom Ruain uh, from the British Library here with me this evening, um, who will introduce to you in a second. But something that you may not know is that if you publish a book or a newspaper or a magazine in the UK, you're obliged to send a copy to the British Library. But it's interesting that law does not require that of sound recordings. And we're going to talk to um, Tom a little bit about what he does at the British Library um, to tr um, save and treasure some of our most uh, valued sound recordings um, here in the UK. So good evening, Tom. How are you doing? Hi, can you hear me? Hey, Tom, how are you? Yeah, we yeah, yeah, good, no good, problem at all. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, I'm um, great. So basically, Tom, good, good. Um, I was just um, saying to everyone that you know, in the UK, um, if you publish a book or newspaper or magazine, you're obliged to send a copy to the British Library, but no such thing is in place um, for sound record. Things. Um, so basically, why don't you tell us um, what it is that you do for the British Library? Okay, yeah. So um, we, so yeah, we don't have legal deposit for sound recordings like we do for uh, printed material, books, and things like that. But we do have. We basically, over many many years, that the Sound Archive has kind of existed, have built up relationships with record labels uh, to basically have them donate everything that they publish to us. So for years, you know, we've had a pretty good relationship that we, that's that been developed. Uh, so we, we kind of get a lot of the published material. It's getting harder because of there's so many different avenues now for kind of music publishing from, you know, I don't know, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, uh, you know, people doing limited runs. So it's it's becoming harder, but we do have uh, we we do now actually kind of receive digital downloads through the kind of same aggregators that uh, you know iTunes and places like that use, uh, and we sort of are building up relationships with uh, other labels and artists that you know we think could donate to us and things like that. So it's 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 always about kind of building up those relationships and you know and getting a kind of presence i guess within the industry so people know what we're doing and why we're doing it i mean the important thing for kind of preservation audio preservation is it's it's our history it's sound heritage um the work i do with the engineers here in the uh center for conservation at the british library in uh, st pancras in london is actually um you know, we hold a huge store below the library. Uh, we've got four floors of sort of uh, collection items that are stored in there. And within that, we have the sound archive, the collection of sound recordings from formats, you know, uh, wax cylinders. We've got tinfoil recording. We've got uh, early digital formats that we've got, row, you know, stacks and stacks of uh, tape. Um, all these things are kind of, becoming harder and harder for us to access and replay and again you know the main issues we're kind of facing is the physical degradation of the objects themselves you know they're kind of chemically quite complex over time that sort of degrades and breaks down um uh, but also the kind of obsolescence of the replay equipment so in order to hear a sound recording you know to hear the content the music or the speech or the wildlife sound, you know, the bird sound, you know, you need the technology to actually play that back. Um, so, you know, you, you're comparing it to kind of, uh, or just discussing, you know, the kind of legal deposit we have for printed material. If you think about that in contrast to a book, for example, you know, if you keep that on a shelf and you keep it in the right storage conditions, you know, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, you can take that book off the shelf you know open it very carefully and you know decipher the content you know assuming you know the language is still kind of understood with a tape recording that's 50 years old 60 years old 
you know, you need the replay equipment. You need the person that knows how to operate it. You need the person that knows how to line up, calibrate it, repair the machine. So the the risk is the risk of losing access to this is more kind of immediate in a lot of ways because you know this technology that we use i mean you know i've got a few tape machines behind me here you know it's essentially obsolete we can't really get spare parts for them anymore the knowledge um of actually operating these machines understanding the tape understanding the kind of issues and uh you know the remedial action or you know getting the carrier into its best sort of possible state in order to get the uh you know best signal from it you know we're kind of losing those skills so it's 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 you know a big part of our job really is trying to kind of build awareness as well you know within kind of the sound music uh audio industry but also you know wider for the public because you know this is kind of cultural heritage it is it is our history really Um, if that's if that answers the question. Well, um, before we go on, the one thing I forgot to mention, it does indeed. Um, but before I go on, I just want to mention to everybody who's watching, um, if you do have any questions during this presentation, um, please feel free to ask them. If you can put them in the comments field in the chat, um, that'll be fantastic. Um, so obviously you told us a little bit about the British Library and what it is that you're doing, um, but let's just find out a little bit about yourself. So tell us about your history, what you studied um, and how you actually got into this. Um, so I was, you know, interested in audio production in the in the sort of more, you know, common, you know, usual way, you know, actually sort of uh engineering things like that so i studied i actually studied uh engineering in uh london college of music in west london uh, a few years ago now and um yeah just you know sort of recording live bands friends things like that um i think when i graduated it was sort of early 2000s maybe kind of 2005 and it was a period where the, I guess the music industry was going through one of its many transitions. This was, you know, a period where kind of internet streaming had started, you know, to take off and, um, you know, technology was a lot easier for, you know, a lot cheaper, I guess, you know, people could get a decent computer at home, run software, buy a decent mic, do their own recording. So quite a lot of studios were closing at that time um so it's you know there's i guess this push for lots of students graduating but not really you know the industry hadn't really transitioned into a place where it is now or you know where it's been in the last few years so it was a lot harder to kind of go down that traditional road of i guess you know uh making the tea in a studio um you know be becoming a runner things like that so um so I I think you know you, you had to sort of think a little bit broader in terms of what 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 was available in that sense and um I I mean I do, I've always been interested in sort of sound like music like kind of the history of music to an extent I mean I always you know when I was listening to I don't know you know 90s rock bands nirvana whatever things like that you know you'd sort of be like who influenced them and sort of trace back and back and back until you know you reach i don't know robert johnson or you know all those blues musicians uh blind willie johnson things like that um and yeah just just i was really interested in that kind of recording technology as well i think um it was sun house was you know he was kind of alive and recording from the acoustic period through to electrical recording you know and from his perspective i mean i read an interview i think and he was sort of saying you know i'd go into a room and play my song you know the difference was instead of there being a big horn in front of me the other people would then be in a different room and a light would appear and they'd you know <laughs> that'd be my cue to go um you know i now know that that you know kind of seismic change in sort of recording technology and stuff like that so i kind of always been interested in that side of things i you know i sort of had a little akai 
uh, reel to reel machine that I used to kind of, you know, do tape experiments on, you know, record oversaturate sort of bass guitar on it and stuff like that, just to see how it sounded. Um, which I guess is ironic now because, you know, you have bands <laughs> like Sono that have made a career out of that type of thing. But, you know, I was there in my bedroom in Leicester. Um, so, yeah, I kind of, I think, I think eventually I, I discovered the sound archive. I think I'd sort of read an article about it or something. And it was, it just seemed like for me, it was this kind of, you know, dream job really to an extent. It was, it was working in sound and engineering, but, you know, working with this older kind of technology, because at the time as well, there wasn't the same level of, you know, a lot of people want tape now, they want to record on tape and they want to, you know, have a tape machine and stuff like that. It That that kind of, um, that hadn't really sort of taken off to the extent. So it was, it was just a place where, you know, you could learn about that stuff. And I mean, I started here as an assistant audio engineer, a role, you know, luckily came up and it was, you know, assisting the engineers doing transfer work myself. But the work we do is very kind of specialized and it's very specific in terms of the kind of outcomes, you know, traditional kind of audio engineering is very much about uh, making things sound nice. You know, we want to get the best sound here. We don't really talk about the best sound we talk about kind of accuracy we're trying to get the most accurate signal from the carrier and digitized in the case of analog audio because that will then become the archival access copy that will become the the reference copy that people listen to in the future because as i said you know the machines the the carriers themselves will degrade and people you know just won't really have the knowledge or understanding to kind of maintain the equipment so it very much becomes about you know uh not getting the best signal but getting the most accurate signal so the reality is if something is badly recorded distorted or um you know has mistakes on it and things like that we're capturing it as it is because we're trying to capture you know, as uh, as it as it as it appeared on that tape, you know, because as I say, that will become the reference copy. That will become what people listen to when the original format is no longer playable, really. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, in terms of my career here, I mean, I've been here 15 years now. I started as assistant engineer, as I said, and then you just learn on the job, really. Um, you know, you can't really learn. You, you know, I don't think many people are going to be able to sort of transfer wax cylinders in their bedroom or anything like that. But, um, you know, that's kind of one of the, I guess, kind of the benefits and, and one of the sort of most interesting parts of the role is you're always sort of learning new things and, you know, you're always encountering things that you hadn't expected. You know, like I said, I've been doing this 15 years and, you know, there's still things that we pull out of the archive and are like, okay, not had this before, you know, what's this, what's this format even? Um, so it's, it's, yeah. So, you know, I then worked as an engineer uh, and now I'm, you know, sort of essentially the lead, the technical manager. So my role is, I guess, less kind of hands-on now, but it's more about sort of, you know, facilitating what the engineers, what the team need and, you know, making sure they're able to do their job uh, effectively and well. That's the idea. Anyway. Okay. It sounds like you're doing a great job. Out there. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, then with with the archive itself, obviously you're generating this huge amount of data and information. Um, obviously, there's going to be copyrighted material there and there's going to be, um, you know, free access material. What happens with it? You know, where does it go and how do people access it and how does that work? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, copyright is, uh, as I'm sure you probably know, it's, inc it's incredibly complicated. Um, I mean, one thing really to remember with the British Library is we don't really own a lot of the content that we hold. We actually hold it. You know, we're custodians of mm. that uh, yeah. content. Um, and obviously, as an archive and the work we're doing, we sort of operate with 
a very long term sort of perspective. So, you know, at a certain point, copyright expires, you know, things go into the public domain, you know, so we're kind of preparing for that as well, in, in a sense, because right. it's, you know, the British Library and the content that it holds, you know, you know, it will be around in the next hundred years um, and and more, you know. So, uh, but yeah, we do generate huge, huge amounts of data, and it's very complex uh, in terms of understanding all of that. Um, so, from an archival perspective, we, you know, we create high resolution uh, or, or, uh, audio files, WAV files, uh, which we create a lot of metadata for. So one thing we have to kind of unpick and spend a lot of time dealing with is almost basically reverse engineering what someone else has done trying to understand how they transferred and created the content that it's on a tape or on you know cassette or whatever so you know in order to uh show that we knew you know we were adhering to kind of best practice we you know list literally all the kind of equipment we use even the connectors things like this very very detailed kind of metadata when the transfer was made um and that goes into you know this a package i guess with the file so it's it's that then goes into the library's kind of digital repository so that's the sort of permanent storage uh, which is you know by uh, you know, the remit that we have is to be kept in perpetuity. So those depo the, those uh, repositories are kind of mirrored across the UK. So there's sites in uh, Scotland, Wales, uh, Yorkshire, where the libraries of the site is. So, you know, the data is kind of secure and we can we can confidently say it's secure. And if we lost access to one of those sites for whatever reason you know we would still have that data elsewhere basically uh so yeah kind of as i you know and as i was going back i mean we once we have a digital file we have you know we have the metadata the information about it but we also have to do kind of lots of data kind of integrity check so you know we need to know that the file we have now is going to be the same 10 years from now you know, 100 years from now. So we use sort of uh, something called checksums and we have, you know, sort of other software that kind of analysis and does kind of quite deep analysis of the files and gives us data about it. Uh, because that that maintenance of the digital repository is, you know, maintaining the archive in the same way we maintain and look after the physical items. Um, right. So it, it yeah. doesn't really end once it's digitized. It then transitions into a much more kind of data management oriented sort of digital preservation process so um yeah because you know the worst thing ever would be to do all that and then you know pull it out and find that there's a problem you know so we have to ensure that the data we put in you know is what it is when it goes in there and it stays like that so um so do you have different teams of people so obviously you've got the people that are taking the historic data, so analog tapes, wax cylinders, foil, whatever it might be, um, doing the, the archiving um, and restoration process. Is there a separate team of people that just focuses on making sure the archive is actually safe, secure, and in playable format? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, t t yeah, basically. I mean, the sort of management of the data in the at the point that it reaches the sort of repository the preservation this is where it's going to stay forever uh, that's managed by a dedicated team who specialize in that data because you know we're putting in lots and lots of sound files but other areas of the mm. library are putting in you know book scans manuscript scans things like that photos so it's you know they need quite a broad level of expertise across all those different things however for us we need to you know, we're kind of the experts in the content that we're generating, the, 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 you know, the material we're generating. So we have to ensure that what we give them is something we know we can play in 30 years time or 50 years time. So, you know, we, 
you know, if we receive digital files and they're in a sort of strange format or proprietary format or something that, you know, I don't know, just has complex metadata contained within it, you know, we need to decide, okay, are we actually going to be able to kind of unpack this data 30 years from now? You know, is it is it actually something that will be playable? Because again, you know, there's no point pulling something out that you can't you can't listen to, basically. So we're always kind of uh, assessing the uh, environment, I guess, and you know what's happening in terms of that. Audio is fairly stable, I would say. I mean, we've happily uh, settled with WAV files for quite a long time now. Um, it's really down to kind of the simplicity in which they're constructed. I mean, I won't go into bore people with the details now, but there's no, you have your audio data and then you have sort of a little bit of data uh, at the start, which has kind of metadata and it tells you all the information you need to know about the audio data. So if, for example, that metadata chunk got damaged, you could still access the audio data and also, mm. you know, it if if a player can't read a certain part of it it can just jump to the next part and sort of access that so we kind of like the simplicity of it in that sense because it, it and and you know the, the obviously the uh adoption across all areas of you know audio and wider industries for for the format so cool so obviously you've got your own archive that you're or you've got your own material that you're trying to archive but i i well we got involved um, with the british library on numerous occasions but one of the particular projects was you know I, the only way i can refer to it is it's a bit like when you go on the antiques you see the antiques road show on a sunday night and somebody comes along and they've got this amazing piece of material and you go where the heck where's that been and it's like been locked up in their garage for yeah the last yeah it's you know you had this thing called the sound heritage project can you tell us a bit more about that uh yeah yeah so um it's we well we have we have a big i mean we have a big program at the moment called save our sounds which has been going for a while which is various different projects and within the, i mean um you know we set up a we're setting up a national radio archive and we're you know the sort of acquisition of digital files and things like that that's kind of part of it you know it's all these different facets and areas of uh you know just capturing content really but the main thing we've been working on the last five years is um the what's called the unlocking our sound heritage uh project which you know we have this kind of knowledge and expertise here in like in the library in london you know and obviously there's other kind of institutions internationally you know library of congress things like that which you know have you know brilliant people there but as you're saying you know there is amazing content across the uk and you know we we were aware that you know we needed to actually um expand that knowledge and you know do some outreach work so we got some funding from the heritage lottery fund uh, and we were able to uh, start working on digitizing a huge amount of the at-risk formats that we have here in the archive but we also went and set up 10 uh, studios in uh, different parts of the uk um, that and you know recruited engineers and got sort of cataloging team uh people working copyright to basically you know they were kind of institutions themselves so they had collections but they would also then reach out to collection holders in their area and actually you know transfer and digitize uh you know content that was significant um you know to, you know nationally internationally you know to their local area um so we did that for three years we set up 10 studios and as you said yeah i mean we uh kitted them out with uh various gear we had sort of uh, a couple of tape machines uh quarter inch tape machines cassette decks that machines uh mini disc uh things like that and then yeah you know we we had uh uh titan converters uh that they were using and um yeah trained the engineers there and got them up to you know you know the knowledge of being able to actually 
work with analog tape, early digital formats like that, you know, do a bit of basic maintenance on their uh, machines to keep them, keep them going. So it's been an amazing project really. And it's been really, really kind of rewarding to work with, you know, with teams because also, you know, part of the process was we would go and train them, show them how to do things. And then, you know, they would go out into their local communities and train more people. And, you know, they had, uh, you know, volunteers and interns working on the projects as well who would, you know, pick up that knowledge. And a big part of it was just, you know, raising awareness and making it, you know, clear to people that we are kind of running out of time. We are, you know, at a certain point this you know we're going to really struggle to be able to transfer and you know uh access a lot of this content and going across the uk and just finding these you know people that had like amazing collections you know and you know a lot of that stuff has now been transferred and it's it's, it's kept here in the british library and you know will be made accessible where where it's possible um you know based on sort of you know current right status and and things like that but uh yeah really really rewarding and it was great to actually do that i mean it's it's been a big project it's it was five years and we're coming to the end of it uh this year basically and um i think it's going to have there's going to be a lot of kind of ripple effects i think you know we we trained those people but as i said they sort of went out and, and trained more people so i think a lot more you know, kind of the next generation of people that are coming up that have been involved in that are going to have a much better understanding of kind of audio preservation and, you know, what's required in order to kind of maintain uh, and, you know, keep ac keepers, you know, being able to access this content. So, yeah, it's been it's been really good. So with that particular project, is there anything that you could tell us that was particularly fascinating for you personally or anything that was sort of a you know a real find for you that you came across on, on on that particular project uh yeah i mean it's it's so broad really i mean it's just so broad. i mean for me personally i mean the most rewarding part was actually working with you know the people that were you know the engineers that were going to be working in the studios because uh, it's just people from you know all different kind of backgrounds and experiences and things like that and just sort of you know helping ignite that interest in you know perking their interest in you know formats that they didn't really kind of deal with you know they may have heard of what the tape is but never really handled it um obviously it varied between people but uh yeah it was just just sort of um you know opening up to i mean it's you know the 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 world I live in is 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 you sort of forget you're in a bit of a bubble in the sense that you know I'm working with you know we're working with analog tape every day we've you know got PCM encoded Betamax tapes it's all kind of totally normal but then you talk to a younger person about this stuff and they've you know got no idea what you're talking about so I think just kind of you know opening that knowledge up to people and sharing it with them was you know really really kind of uh just fascinating really rewarding really so um yeah I, I, I brought that so, with, you know that, no that's great answer that so with that in mind you know um it kind of you mentioned particularly about betamax which uh, you know a lot of younger people who are watching this probably you've never heard of um and have you ever come across any media that you've had trouble retrieving or that you haven't been able to play back and if so, how have you dealt with that? Have you had to go off and find things that will play it back? You know, what, what problems have you come up against? Yeah, we've quite a few, really. I mean, there's there's formats that we can technically transfer but are degraded to a point that we can't actually, through traditional methods, you know, we can't transfer them. I mean, a good example is lack of discs. So these are the, you know, uh you know if you if you buy vinyl now it will before it's sent to a pressing plant it will be cut on a lathe onto a lacquer disc or you know what you know sometimes called dub plates things like that you know the material it's an aluminium disc that's then coated in a cellulite cellular cellular <laughs> i can't say it uh cellulose <laughs> nitrate lacquer um 
you know, which which coats typically, you know, an aluminium disc. So, you know, in good condition, you know, as soon as it's cut, you you know, it 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 can be played basically. You know, you can just play it as you would, you know, any sort of uh, vinyl record. Uh, what happens over time? It because you know they're meant to be sent to a pressing plant where they'll grow the sort of nickel plates and you know produce the stampers for the vinyl or uh, whatever. Um, but what happens with those is they degrade severely over time. So they have a kind of a plasticizer in them. So, you know, when you cut a disc, you know, I'm sure you know this, you know, it's heated, it cuts the groove and then it cools down and it hardens. And, you know, that's when you can kind of play it. The plasticizer essentially kind of separates from the, uh, the compound and extrudes. It comes out the top and it looks like a kind of dust sometimes but it's it's quite like chalky it's quite smudgy and um it hardens and it shrinks so basically the disc remains you know the hard disc in the center remains and it shrinks and it cracks and it breaks so we've got some examples where you know literally the grooves are falling off the disc and we can't you know you can't stick a stylus in and start playing that because you're going to shred it to pieces so uh we've got things like that where they're just so severely degraded that we can't actually transfer them. I mean, uh, scanning technology exists. I mean, you know, Library of Congress have uh, their Irene system. Um, we actually, we, so I think I met, we have a tinfoil recording. So tinfoil is, tinfoil phonograph was before wax cylinders. It was Thomas Edison's uh, first invention for a device that could record and replay sound you would just have a, literally a piece of tin you would wrap it around a drum there was a horn you would hand crank it and it would emboss a groove it wouldn't cut it was soft material so press it in um so we have that and there's no means to play something like that you know that you, you can't wrap it back onto a drum or anything like that it's so fragile and i think the one we received was actually in in several pieces um, so yeah, there's there's kind of disc scanning. There's there's scanning technology in existence. And in 2008, we were involved with a research project with University of Southampton, where they were developing uh, some technology, and they actually scanned this tin foil. Um, so, uh, I mean, the content on it is it sounds like a human voice. It's not really. You can't really hear what they're saying. It's, you know, it's very kind of low fidelity recording in that sense. But it, um, you know, we had no means of accessing that content. And from a historical and technological perspective, it's really, really interesting because, you know, as technology develops and grows, you know, we are actually able to access more and more of this content. Um, but that's that's kind of, you know, you know, linked to kind of the the, the you know degradation the conditions of the formats to an extent but i mean we hold so in terms of the items we hold they're across uh we've, we actually did a sort of survey of everything that we hold and we've got 40 different audio formats in the archive um so you know obviously the common ones are tape various types of disc but we have lots of quite unique uh funny formats as we like to like you call them but um yeah you know you do occasionally pull something out and go okay what's this and how do we play it does anyone know anything about yeah. it so you know that's where you you know the community of people working in audio archiving you you know take a photo put it online and say does anyone know what this is can anyone help us out um i mean i think the most recent example i've had is uh, a collection uh, ethnomusicologist who sort of recorded uh, from the 70s right up to the kind of early 2000s and it was just it was you know it was almost like the history of tape recording you know it started off on a uh, quarter inch tape cassette uh, that you know and so on but they had uh, these tiny tiny little digital tapes called NT tapes which was developed by Sony in the early 90s it was uh the nickname was a scoop man i think it was basically supposed to be the digital replacement for uh you know this sort of very small 
micro cassette dictation devices that uh, uh, you know interviewers and you know the press would use. Um, and we were like, okay, we don't have a machine. We're going to have to get a machine for this. So we had to just find a machine, you know, on eBay, probably. I can't remember exactly where we purchased it from and, you know, get it. And that was it. That was the only means of playing it because it was such an obscure format. You know, no new technology has been developed to help you transfer that or get a better signal off it or anything like that. So, you know, we literally had to just, you know, scour the internet try and find one of these recorders that we could uh play the tapes back in so yeah it, it does happen it's um it's i mean that's one thing we sort of you know the reason we did this survey of the collections we held because it was like okay what have we got do we have the technology in order to play it back um and if not we need to acquire it really so but yeah, I mean, physical degradation is the biggest thing, really. I mean, you know, um, you know, we have so much tape, and the condition that a lot of tape is in these days is makes it very difficult to, you know, uh, actually transfer it, really, um, just because it's, you know, it's degraded so severely. So. so, do you do you ever get tapes in where, obviously, the nineties is a perfect example of this, where you know, we were recording audio onto VHS and, um, you know, you've got paid ads and that kind of stuff. Do you ever get tapes in that you think, oh, this is an audio recording and it turns out to be video? Um, I don't think we've really, I mean, I think the thing is, yeah, sort of encoded Betamax or VHS. I mean, if you put it in a in an actual video machine connected to a monitor, you'll see it's kind of like organized static. It's all, you know, you yeah. see the sort of the noise basically in an organized sort of, you know, binary fashion basically, because it's encoded, you know, the, it's encoded yeah. into the video signal. Um, I mean, I guess the most, I mean, one of the things we deal with really, and to be honest with you, is still kind of a bit of a struggle is um, mixed mode kind of CDs. So, you know, that can be particularly kind of enhanced CDs where, as you're saying, kind of early 90s, you know, you might have, I don't know, David Bowie CD with a video on it or, you know, some long abandoned website, things like that. And it's that's that's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, OK, right, this isn't just an audio yeah. signal. Yeah. There's something else here. And, you know, how do we deal with that? How do we capture that? Um so yeah there's there's lots of lots of uh you know you, you think something's going to be straightforward but there's always you know a few few kinks along the way in that sense so um yeah it always keeps you on your toes yeah <laughs> so in that kind of context then obviously you've, you've got a lot of diverse skills and you know you've learned a lot over the 15 years that you've been with the british library so what what skills do you think make a successful engineer in your, your role uh, I think audio preservation is, I think that you, I think you have to have a real kind of uh, passion and interest for kind of sound as a sort of cultural, historical, you know, having that kind of value, something that, you know, is kind of significant and is going to be important, uh, you know, long after I'm here or uh, any of us are. Um, you know, interest in the older technology, you know, an understanding of, uh, you know, we, you, you have, you develop a lot of kind of very esoteric skills and sort of esoteric knowledge around, uh, you know, things like tape degradation, you know, why is this tape not playable? Okay. It could be these reasons. Okay. What kind of remedial action can we take? Oh, you know, this disc is this type of disc, you know, you can identify it. Um, so you you kind of have to have a really you know get a lot of time with the different formats to really kind of understand uh you know how to get the best signal out of them or most accurate as i like to say but um you know without kind of damaging it or you know uh because this is the thing i mean again with tape you know classic example is someone can will put a tape on a tape machine and be like oh it's you know it's really muffled oh yeah you know it's just an old tape but actually 
you know, the head blocks on the tape machines here, you know, you have an azimuth adjustment. You can move the position of the head to align it correctly with the uh, tape as it passes over. And that will suddenly open up all the high frequencies and you suddenly get a much higher fidelity recording. So, you know, without kind of that knowledge and understanding, you would just be like, oh, and also, you know, we have tapes, uh, uh, what we call B wound, which so traditionally you have, you know, reel to reel and the tape faces inwards and goes past the head. Uh, you know, a technique that particularly used in broadcast a lot, people would flip the tape over when they wound it. So it would be facing outwards, which is to help reduce kind of print through and things like that. So you can put a tape on and if you don't know what you're listening for, you'll just think, oh, it's a muffled recording, but actually you're you're playing the back of the tape you know <laughs> you're not actually yeah. <laughs> you know, getting the, the signal you should be getting so you kind of yeah you, you build up a lot of this kind of uh knowledge and kind of understanding which is you know which is why it kind of needs to be shared really as well i mean um you know that's why you know we kind of understand the, the necessity of kind of doing outreach and, and kind of making this information uh you know, more knowledgeable amongst people working with this type of format. So, um, yeah, and I think I think just, you know, like anything audio engineering related, good ears, you know, working with the technology. I mean, I'm sure it's totally normal for sort of younger generation now, but, you know, that's the thing, you know, a big part of it is it's not just, oh, right, we've done that, we've done that transfer, we've done that recording. It's actually like, okay, we've got these files now. How do we describe them? How do we ensure that they are secure and safe? And then when we give them to, you know, the sort of the team that manages the repository, you know, and it's it's kind of under, even that, yeah, kind of, you know, I was talking about a, a wave file, the structure of a wave file, you know, you kind of have to really get into the kind of nuts and bolts of uh, these type of things, you know. I mean, we had a couple of years ago, we ripped about 4,000 CDRs, which were donated by the Glastonbury Festival. It was, they used to uh, run a uh, kind of open competition. You could submit a demo and you'd go through, you know, the stages of competition. And if you got picked, you'd get to get, play on the main stage, uh, well, on one of the stages, come if it's the main stage. And, um, you know, we had to do load, lots and lots of research into the sort of error detection and correction systems that are used by cds because we needed to ensure that the software and the hardware we had you know weren't kind of uh you know making any kind of subjective corrections you know trying to make it sound nice for us because you know we wanted to extract the data as it was on the disc um so yeah i think you know if you if you're interested in in the technology as well as the actual sound the music or the you know the you know whatever whatever the recording is um you know that's that's a good place to start really i think if anyone's kind of interested in that, that type of thing and, and you so, know moving into this industry so you you touched obviously you just touched on it there and you touched on it in your your previous answer you know if somebody was looking to get into doing what you do um and carving a career path themselves how would they go about it is there any well, like obviously you did a qualification at university but then sort of almost diversified or, or sort of went into this particular role um is there anything formal training or is, is it something that you know you um, just look for an opportunity yeah it's, it's a bit difficult i mean yeah the sort of route i guess i took wasn't sort of traditional in that sense i mean i think we're probably i mean you know i've talked about the sort of you know the risk we're facing and the sort of the you know we run you know the sense that we're kind of running out of time but in some ways this is probably the best time to get into audio preservation archiving if that's what you're interested in because there's a much greater awareness of the type of work we're doing and the work that's being done internationally by you know all these kind of amazing archives um and you know people are starting to listen and go oh wait a minute you know we've got these you know amazing recordings you know even musicians you know are, are starting to you know look back at their old tapes and go uh okay you know are these playable what what you know what condition are these in 
So I, I guess for someone here that's kind of interested, yeah, just learn about the technology, learn about the various things. I mean, there's kind of, you know, specific to kind of audio preservation. You know, we have standards bodies like the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, uh, IASA. You know, they set the standards for what we what we do. And just, you know, if you, you know, look for local musicians in your area, look for people that are, you know, communities that are making recordings, even if they're just recording their own, you know, local bands or venues, things like that, because they've probably got stuff going back onto, you know, tape or cassette or that or something like that. And, yeah, that would be a really good project, you know, to get into and uh, and actually sort of, you know, help them kind of you know transfer this stuff because a lot of people you know they don't know where to start with it really because it looks you know it's it looks scary it's like okay i've got all these different things and you know they're old audio formats what do i do with them so i think yeah just look in your and as i said you know we've had this big uh unlocking our sound heritage project where you know these um uh you know there, there are sort of uh local archives and communities that are actually you know been trained in this type of thing um so i would just look at what's going on in your area and you know and just see what collections there are and you know see how you can get involved in that kind of thing um and also you know a lot more record labels now you know whether it's the majors going back to sort of their you know masters but also smaller kind of you know labels that do more kind of specialist limited runs you know they're going back to maybe more obscure things that were released in the past they've got that they've got access to the master tapes because it's not some huge artist and they're you know going to do a run of 500 um you know vinyl you know they're going to uh, press 500 discs or something like that um so yeah, and just just get involved in the community. I mean, audio and music and things like that. A lot of it's, you know, ha building up personal relationships goes a long way. I think you know, getting you, you know, getting talking to people and getting you know, people want to share what they know. You know, I mean, you know, people people love talking about themselves, don't they? So you know, I think uh, I think just you know, find engineers that are doing this kind of thing and chat to them. You know, people love to love to share the information normally. Cool. So yeah, a bit of a bit of a you know all over the place answer, but yeah, I think I think we're in a in a, well, a better position than we've been for a long time. Really. Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting answer because you know most of us start out doing one thing and we end up doing something completely different, but it's always in audio, you know, in some form or another. But I think that's the beauty of our industry. Um, so you've worked on a diverse array of projects. Um, what is the most interesting one that you can remember? um i think yeah i mean I th the the big project we've done recently i mean i think as an engineer just sort of going back a little bit you know some of the things i've worked on um you know the library obviously uh it's a public institution and you know we put on exhibitions and stuff like that so i did quite a lot of uh uh that stuff i used to do that so we had a, a, a big punk exhibition uh, a few years ago now, so punk nineteen seventy six to seventy eight, I think, and it was just it was you know just covering that very short but you know incredible period of you know UK music, and um, just the people I met, I met some really really incredible people, and just worked on some amazing stuff. I mean, we had one of the uh, founder members of. Uh, Subway Sect bring in some early recordings of the band just like rehearsing you know it wasn't really for anything um, that he was just like yeah I've got the I found these tapes you know um, we had you know amazing people come in I mean John Lydon came in and did a talk uh, I recorded an interview with Danny Fields who was the manager for uh, well he discovered the MC5 and uh, the Stooges I don't know if discovered is the right word he signed them they were always there um and managed uh uh the ramones which is sort of the main thing really really interesting humble guy um 
yeah so that that was that was quite cool and it was a real you know i've obviously you know we've been listening to that kind of music for a long time but it was really good to have people that were there coming in talking about it and then you know bringing in all this extra material you know things that hadn't been heard and uh you know that's you know it's now with the library and it, it was you know available at the exhibition so um that was that was a pretty good one i mean it's it's you know and again it raises awareness of what we're doing because you know how could you describe the you know that that moment in history that was punk without having the music without having the audio um so you know it 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 shows i think you know why this stuff is so significant and you know so valuable really okay and sort of moving on diversifying a little bit away from that question but it's similar in a way is obviously that was the most interesting project and I was going to say the most difficult, but I think that'd be putting you on the spot. So, what would you be saying is the most challenging project that you've worked on? Um, I don't know. I mean, basically, it it de it depends. It varies week to week. I mean, you you it's just you'll hit a format, you'll hit a tape or something that is really you you know it's got something on there, but it's it's just it's it's in such condition that you have to really work to get the audio off it i mean we talked about um so you know tape degrades a common thing for kind of uh you know polyester tape the sort of later kind of uh 19 you know 70s onwards tape brands that we used uh tape formulations that we used you know they can suffer from something called um what we could sticky shed syndrome which is uh it basically moisture is absorbed from the atmosphere and um it causes the so tape is essentially you've got you know in this example polyester a piece of plastic and you've got a magnetic oxide on top where you know the magnetic energy is organized in the sequence of a sound wave um but that magnetic oxide breaks down it has a kind of glue or binder we call it that holds it all together and that sort of starts to you know the moisture causes it to break apart and the tape will stick or adhere to you know the adjacent layer and when you play the tape if you don't know that's happened it will squeal so that's a common thing and you get all the oxide builds up on the head and obviously that's essentially the content being rubbed off the off the tape so you can you can bake tapes that are suffering from sticky shed syndrome but what we have now understanding is the it's such a complex issue that actually a lot of the time it's not that it's other things it's you know the chemicals are breaking down in a different way uh and it just you know you can't bake the tape so what do you do okay well you need to uh i guess juice the friction as the tape passes over the head well how do you do that okay well we could lubricate it so you know we've had sort of diy devices that help us kind of keep the tape lubricated as it passes over the tape head which requires basically an engineer sitting you know with their nose against the tape <laughs> ensuring that it's it's you know getting that that kind of lubrication um you know we have custom built i don't know if custom built is the right word we have a again a sort of you know uh designed and built british library special which is uh, what we call the grandfather clock which will basically unspool a tape at a very slow speed so you've got a um, a take-up spool at the top and the bottom it's just a sort of six foot uh, board with a motor that runs and then it heats the tape as it passes and um, it just it just un un slowly unwinds the tape one revolution a minute hence the, the name the grandfather clock so that's the kind of thing where you like you go in for your day and you think oh just you know do that tape and then you like working on it for three days or something trying to get the signal off it um i mean i've had I, I i did have a recording a few years ago where it was on tape and it was a theater group i won't name them here not that it's anything to do with them it's just the condition of the tape but it had obviously been played back at some point before reaching the archive even in this degraded condition so a lot of the oxide it was so degraded that a lot so much of the oxide had actually stuck to the back of the tape that actually 
I took the traditional transfer at the, you know, what would have been the oxide layer front side and then did another transfer and just played the back of the tape because there was so much oxide adhered to the back of the tape that actually, you know, at some sections I was able to get a better signal. Um, right. But in that case, you know, that's all you can do really because it's already degraded to the point and at some, you know, somewhere previous to reaching us, it's been played back by someone that didn't know what they were doing and it's it's damaged it even further so you know we were able to extract the signal but it's it's incredibly difficult in that sense um so yeah there's not you know there's a, there's not one specific item it's it, there's always something around the corner that you're going to have to uh think creatively about how to how to get the um the signal off it really and you you kind of touched on this earlier, and I'm interested to you know because we've got we've only got about five minutes left, um, and I'm interested to ask you about this. You know, you mentioned about capturing the media in its purest form, but are there any instances where I'm going to use the word remaster or I don't know tweak whatever you want to call it um, the, the media to improve the audio, or do you look at this on a case by case basis, or is it literally However, it comes out, and that's how we're capturing it. So, for stuff, so basically, we'll always have an archival master, which is, you know, we 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 do all the preparation work. We'll put the carrier, the format, in, you know, like very simple example. You know, if we've got a disc, we'll clean it before we transfer it. You know, we won't just transfer it with the muck on it or the dust or whatever. You know again tape you know if it's suffering from sticky shed syndrome we'll bake it so we'll put the tape in or whatever format in the best you know in the, its optimal condition i guess and the same thing with the machines that we replay we make all the adjustments that are necessary in order to get the most you know the best signal out of the carrier but we wouldn't make any what we kind of call subjective decisions we wouldn't say oh that sounds nicer with a bit of eq or let's do a bit of noise reduction on that however we would you know for listening purposes you know researchers members of, excuse me, members of the public coming in to listen to the recordings um you know or if it's something we're going to put on the website you know that's where you know we would have an engineer you know spend a bit of time uh yeah you know just just putting them into a sort of um you know something that people more are expecting to hear i guess is the word if you know what i mean so if it's on a website you know we want to make sure everything's the right level it's it, it sounds good you know we're not doctoring the sound in any kind of significant ways but we're just making it more kind of presentable i guess in that sense right but the archival copy the 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 master as we call it which goes into the repository is always you know the, the most accurate and sort of like for like version that exists on the original carrier in that sense we wouldn't make any kind of uh, uh any alterations really in that sense okay and you know coming to, coming to the last few questions that i've got for you um is there anything that you're currently working on that you can tell us about um currently working on i mean we're sort of just always working on uh getting as much stuff transferred as we can i mean i guess from the archives perspective you know we've had uh, a couple of recent donations uh collections that have been a, a quite significant i mean uh last uh i mean the last one probably that um i mean it's not kind of officially been announced but i can talk about it a little bit is we uh received pj harvey's archive so you know from pj harvey it's all her demos um i mean it seems as though she was uh you know very good at kind of recording and archiving her own material you know there's lots of uh, early uh live recordings that she made herself on sort of tape and cassette and things like that we've got um dash tapes uh you know from obviously her studio sessions handwritten books uh, notebooks and uh, lyric sheets um and also the actual original kind of homemade cassette demo she sent to john peel which is i guess you know where she got picked up and uh you know her career sort of took off so 
that's something we're going to – I mean, one thing really is we don't hold a huge amount of multi-track material because that's kind of, you know, record labels and artists and the stand we kind of hold on to a lot of that stuff. But we do have some, and a lot of her material falls into that. So, again, we are going to start looking now at how best to – archive that you know because this is the thing you know individual stems or a sort of multi-channel file or you know how do we present that to a user you know you just blast everything out of them at the same you know volume um so that's going to require i mean this is one of these things where we're going to have to kind of dig into it see what other people are doing and actually you know make decisions that we feel comfortable with you know that will you know still stand in the next i don't know 20 30 years or something so that's that's going to be quite a, uh, an interesting sort of uh thing to unpick really yeah um and you know last couple of questions um so the last couple of years have been an interesting time for all of us and um it has enabled us to work in innovative and creative ways um how do you see this you know affecting not only the audio industry but how it affects the way you work um at the british library um i think that it has it's yeah it's difficult i mean it was it was really hard at the start i think when we just sort of uh, with everyone you know just suddenly were like oh you know you can't do this now you can't access the studios you can't you know i think we were pretty good to quickly move to kind of remote working i think you know the reality is you need to be in a studio to transfer and you know work on this material uh but i think we you know this thing i was talking about you know this very sort of detailed metadata we create things like that you know we we were able to kind of remotely access all those kind of systems that we use and actually kind of you know do a lot of that processing work and things like that um so i think i think we just had to diversify and look at the ways that we were working and actually sort of uh you know you know try and sort of try and meet the challenge really in that sense uh i think for the broader industry and i think for the archive in general it's been really interesting in the sense that you know some really innovative things have been done remotely you know recording sessions done remotely bands doing you know live performances over zoom on you know or youtube or whatever so i think for you know as collecting that kind of material that's really interesting because you know it's 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 something that's you know may have been happening a little bit before covid but it's it's really sort of become a you know became a thing during that period and it you know it may sort of um disappear a little bit as things continue to open up but i think it's again you know from a sort of you know cultural nerdy historical perspective it's one of those things that you can look back and go oh look at you know this amazing thing you know all this amazing music or whatever that was produced during that kind of period i mean again within the library you know we have our uh oral history team they they record um interviews with you know anyone from kind of any walk of life really you know uh you know to capture history you know from sort of you know, as I said, sort of, you know, people from across the spectrum of society. I mean, they, you know, were like, okay, we still need to capture what's going on now. How do we do that? Okay, well, you know, we'll have to do it remotely, you know. So they sort of had to, you know, work and sort of uh, do these interviews remotely and stuff like that. So, again, that's kind of, you know, a two-year period, I guess, where we've got this chunk of material that's produced in a very specific way. Um so i think I, I don't know i mean i don't know if that really answers the question but i think it i think for me it just yeah it, it just showed how we can you know as as humans can you know we can quickly diversify and sort of adapt to things as they as they happen i mean um you know a lot of a lot of i think that's you know that's one of the things that has come out of the last two years there's not much that's beautiful could have come out of it but the beautiful thing for me is the fact that we've been able to diversify and it shows how adaptable we as humans have been um and the last question for you this evening um is 
what can we expect from the British Library? Because obviously you've mentioned about some of the projects that have been going on over the last five years. What can we expect from not yourself, Tom, but the British Library in the rest of this year? Uh, so we are going to actually be launching our website. So we have a we have a website where we have uh, archive material that's been made available and can be accessible. We're revamping that and a lot of the material that we have um, that's been generated uh, by the these regional studios that we've set up, you know, a lot of that stuff's going to be made, you know, obviously where copyright uh, allows is going to be made available and a lot of the stuff we've been working on for the last five years. So um, there's not a, there's not a, you know, there's not a, uh, uh, a date I can publicize yet, but uh, that'll be, you know, there's going to be a lot more kind of audio content that people will be able to access uh, from home in the reading rooms, things like that. So it's, it's quite exciting in that sense because it's a chance to show all the amazing stuff that we've been doing over the last sort of five years or so. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the big thing on the horizon. Fantastic. Well, do you know what, Tom? It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll get the date off you when it, you do have it available. I'll make sure we get it posted. Not we'll let you know. Yeah. Time. Yeah. We'll let you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch on that one. But once again, thank you so much for your time. And for everybody who's watching, um, thank you for your time this evening. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you on the next Creative Conversation very soon. Thanks. Good night. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.